Good afternoon. Welcome to Fontenelle Final Bell here on the Rural Radio Network. I'm Susan Littlefield. A variety of things that we're going to look at today. If you miss the close on the corn market, you may go back and have to rub your eyes and wonder what the heck is going on. We're going to talk about that drop that we saw within the trade. China making some big purchases and then the weather. Did it rain? Did it not rain in your backyard? I've had a few conversations with producers that are literally Mike watching their corn dry up, their dry land corn. As we're talking with Mike Zuzalo today of Global Commodity Analytics and some tough times for producers as we also focus on the back half of this marketing year. But let's first out, Mike, let's start out with this corn. What happened right there at the close? Well, I think we had the strength in the early part of the day, thanks to the record Chinese purchases. Uh, they did come in with almost 69 million bushels of purchases, the biggest one-time purchase we've ever seen from them. And I think it has to do with both their issues domestically with some of their flooding uh, in their central and southern parts of China, and also has to do with easing the political tensions. But the close, we saw the ethanol slip over 7%. And we saw the uh, corn market really react to that. So I think, Susan, there's two things driving this market right now, both of them supply related. And so the Chinese purchases, I believe, may not be traded until we get to the weekly export sales on Thursday, because everybody that I talk to, whether it's a producer, and you just talked about it a, a second ago, whether it's a producer or a trader or colleague in Chicago or another market analyst that I've spoken with in the past couple of weeks, Everybody's talking about supply. Everybody's talking about which weather model is correct. And most of the trade has settled on the GFS American weather model. That model is much wetter and just as importantly, much cooler than the European model. So that high ridge of pressure that we all were talking about a week ago, uh, four or five days before the USDA WASDE report, uh, that did not materialize for most of the market areas in the Corn Belt, and the market participants are taking that at face value. So it's a very binary market right now where weather, rainfall in Iowa and Illinois are going to be, in my opinion, probably 80 or 85 percent of the trade. The other part of it, I think, was the ethanol giving way. I don't know whether it was just because the July futures expire today, and that really unwound the ethanol or whether it happened to do with President, Vice President Biden talking and talking about a green energy plan right as the grain markets were closing. I did not see anything on the news wires. I did not hear anything in his speech that said specifically anything negative about ethanol, but he was very much talking up the green energy. So I'm not sure if that pulled some money out or not. There's a lot of fingers in this market pot today, um, from weather to China to, to people talking, and, and I'm sure there's going to be some social media tweets as we get ready to head into the overnight trade that could have some effects as well on this. Yes, and I think you bring up a really big point. That's not going to change. We're going to have a lot of fingers in this marketing pot, as you say, all the way into the election and probably all the way post-election uh, as we get into 2021. I think this is where the hedger the grain farmer, the cattle rancher, who probably needs to buy feed, really should be on point right now because our pasture and range conditions are really suffering at this point. That was the biggest thing that came out to me uh, on the crop conditions report on Monday afternoon. We're looking at a good to excellent here in this country of about 36% in uh, conditions of pasture. That's about half of what it was last year at this time. Nebraska has made the list. It's below 50% good to excellent. Kansas is at 41% good to excellent on pasture. Texas beat us all. 24% of the Texas pasture is 24% good to excellent. If you need feed, this is the time to buy it, in my opinion, as a rancher and as a feeder of livestock, because especially if you rely upon that summer grazing, you're probably going to be very disappointed in about 30 days, because it doesn't look like the Western Corn Belt's really going to cool off at all. So even an inch of rain, if we still say, stay close to triple digit heat, it's not going to do much good for what you're pasturing right now and what your cattle are going to need to graze here this summer and this fall. So that's probably point number one to be made as we talk about on today's Fontenelle Final Bell. You know, I mean, it's very frustrating for these cattle guys, and I'm sure we'll, we'll dive more into it as well as we continue. But you look at the grain stocks and the things that are needed right now for these livestock producers and the need to make that purchase of grain and wondering, like you said, do I do it now? How much do I buy and what am I going to need going into fall? 
Yeah, and I think basically what I've heard from Kansas and, and uh, Oklahoma and Nebraska producers uh, right now in the cash corn market and what they're growing right now is it could be a good crop, but it's nowhere near where it was two years ago in 2018. Um, and, and this goes back to the basis levels and di differentiating between the futures price and the cash basis in your local area. If you've got green snap, if you're some of those people that had the 80 mile an hour winds that I heard a lot about today in Nebraska, this is one of those times where you want to start thinking, well, is my basis really going to get that much worse, especially with the ethanol plants coming back online? So as a buyer who wants to buy low, think of what China did today. They came in and bought corn, the biggest amount of corn they've ever purchased below before. Was it all political? Did they need it? Well, regardless of what the answer is, they felt like the price was right to go ahead and do it. And I think that's the number one thing China always looks at, no matter what they're looking at uh, in the scope of things, it's always about the price. So think about what the Chinese did today and think about your own needs right now if you're in those locations. And, and definitely, I think this really stresses the fact that we need to look beyond our back door because I know I look out at my pastures and they're starting to dry up. So it makes me think of need to make feed purchases. But then I look at these crops. I mean, irrigated looks okay. Dry land in many areas is definitely suffering and it's going to look like we're growing pineapple pretty soon. You're exactly right. And that's where your basis pole is going to come into play. You may have good crops in your areas, but 25 miles away in an ethanol plant where they need more corn, they're going to pull your corn away from you by that basis play. So cash corn is king, in my opinion. And just to finish up on this segment, I think it's real important what you said about the global market. Uh, China, the USDA just released the meat statistics here yesterday. China is now going to be 43% of global pork imports this year. They're going to be just under 30% of global beef imports this year. So don't kid yourself. The Chinese-US trade tensions and the relationship between these two countries are going to be more important as we get closer to the election because ag is more deeply involved in it, especially the meat sector. All right, let's stick around, folks. We do have a lot more coming up. It is the Fontenelle Final Bell right here on the Rural Radio Network. Welcome back to the Fontenelle Final Bell here on the Rural Radio Network. I'm Susan Littlefield. As we continue our conversation with Mike Suzlo with Global Commodity Analytics. And, and Mike, we've made it through... <laughs> It's like, woohoo, we've made it. We've made it through the first half of, of 2020. And quite the struggle it's been, both from a grain and a livestock perspective. But now we got to get through the second half of this year. And a lot of things are factoring in, like you talked about in the first segment, the weather, the, the international trade that we're seeing. And then we'll just throw the dollar in for a little excitement as well. Yeah, and this is the good news of the market. And it's kind of an odd situation that's developing right now by some of the larger banks and some of the bigger Wall Street analysts at this point, Susan, they're in starting to become of the view that if the United States worsens in COVID, uh, the dollar will actually continue to weaken and because we will be the slower one of the big economies to be able to come back to pre-pandemic levels and that's gonna punish us in our currency. Well, that may be on Wall Street, but that actually will keep us very competitive in the commodity sphere. And so we don't have as much fear about the energy markets leading us lower. We don't have as much fear of the major competitors of grain uh, the exporters uh, taking us uh, lower because of the fact that they compete against us more effectively when our dollar is stronger. Um, this is one of those things where it could bode very well for the commodities in that we don't do much more than a trading range market. So I think that if we don't have weakening tensions or worsening tensions between the U.S. and China in the trade policies, uh, then the dollar does indeed continue to weaken, then the market will probably work itself into a trading range market. So we'll get through the weather market here in the next five to 10 days, and the supply side will be assumed after that. I think the trade does that very well. They just assume that the supply is going to be an X yield per bushel in the country, and it may be up around 180 in corn and 50 in beans, and they just settle on that. So then we'll go back to demand. And if we go back to demand with a weaker dollar, I think we've got a situation where it's just a trading range market. Doesn't make it good from a standpoint of getting bigger moves up to get better gross revenue per acre, but also probably brings the bottom up and the floor up in terms of lower prices not being as drastic as they have been. Uh, livestock's gonna be a lot more volatile, I think. And it, the charts look that way and the fundamentals look that way. And I think the beef cattle especially 
are going to be a lot more volatile because they're going to take their lead from the pork, which has already been so volatile. And, and the cattle and the beef are not winning the retail sector uh, demand wars and, and uh, consumption wars. Retail, uh, the box beef select price is actually up about 2% right now, whereas your poultry price is down about 20% and your pork cutout prices are down roughly 20% as well. So if you're seeing that featuring of the pork and the poultry come through really strong since July 4th, I don't look for that to change. So it's really gonna put the beef on the defensive. And that, that's probably the biggest issue where I think you could have a lot more volatility. So from a consumer who's listening to us talk about this, what does this all mean to them when they're saying, well, demand there, I go buy meat every week at the grocery store, but across the country, and how's that going to affect their prices? Well, and this is where the consumer price index finally picked up on what you and I are feeling as consumers. Both the food and energy categories were the highest, I believe, in three months. And that's directly related to this broken supply chain and this, um, uh, this hoarding and this extra buying that consumers are doing. If we have another COVID ramp up, we'll probably continue to hoard and buy extra. So don't look for any cheaper prices except in things like maybe office supplies or something like that or clothing where you don't go to work anymore and you don't have to dress up as much or you don't have to buy those big metal office chairs that, uh, you know, and, and these skyscrapers and stuff like that. For, but for the food sector, it's probably going to, you know, continue to be higher prices. What we need is that to translate into higher producer prices. But that's going to be really tough until we cut supplies because the bottom line is, is that the, the retailer doesn't need to cut prices right now because the consumer is buying at these higher prices. So it's going to be tough for both the producer and the consumer. And the, uh, I think the middleman will be doing just fine. Everybody's got to eat. So they're, if they need to pay the price, they're going to do it. That's right. So what are we seeing uh, for, for the second half for our, for our livestock producers? Is there certain areas that we need to focus on when it comes to, to marketing so we can get the best return on our investment? Yeah, I mean, I think quarter four is probably looking to be the best out of the next two quarters. And I say that watching the drought in the Southern Plains, we have not seen these weights come down. And with this uh, new, the new deaths in the United States, I just checked before we did this final bell, the new deaths in the United States are ticking up related to COVID. So this greater number of uh, uh, COVID uh, cases and hospitalizations are also turning into new deaths, unfortunately. And if that trend continues like it is in Mexico and India and the United States, then we're probably going to continue to see a lackluster demand mindset. They're not going to pay up uh, in other countries for a lot because they're not going to be able to afford it. So I think the third quarter is still going to be pretty tough for the beef cattle. It's the fourth quarter where I think maybe the supplies drop, weights drop because of the drought. We've gotten the cattle in the feedlots and they're off the pastures. And then all of a sudden we start to see the economy come back around as well. Uh, hopefully with no uh, issues with the fall and a resurgence then during uh, about the COVID because we're having that now. So I think quarter four is looking better and uh, maybe five to seven dollars better than the D's futures price is right now. All right, Mike, what's the best way for folks to get a hold of you? Best way to get a hold of me is globalcomresearch.com or do what that person's doing right now. Call me at 866-471-2588. Just a reminder, folks, commodity futures and options do involve substantial risk of loss. They're not suitable for all investors. That is the Fontenelle Final Bell being brought to you by Fontenelle Hybrids and all your local Fontenelle dealers. Check it out as a podcast at ruralradio.com, wherever you subscribe and on Spotify as well. It is the Fontenelle Final Bell right here on the Rural Radio Network. <laughs>